Ichigo and Rukia, a soul reaper and a boy from the world of a living, a king and a queen, death and the strawberry, the sun and the moon. Ichigo and Ruki are two characters that I loved from the start of Bleach. And as I loved their characters, I also began to love the relationship that developed throughout the series between them. They were the first relationship I saw on a show where it felt like the characters were literally meant to meet one another and be something together. As if their two worlds colliding had turned them both into something completely different. They were two people that were fated to meet, changed each other for the better, and discovered themselves together. For me, at the age of 13, it was some otherworldly romance I just did not see in live action TV shows. Anime introduced me to romances which weren't limited to reality but could delve into fantasy or my preferred genre at the time, the supernatural, but a contemporary supernatural. Bleach was the second anime I ever watched but it was the first anime I loved and extreme enough to cause me to ship characters in it, and Ichiruki was the first ever anime ship I had. Today's video, we will be discussing a topic very close to my heart, Ichigo and Rukia's relationship throughout the entirety of a Bleach anime. Why did 13-year-old me latch onto this ship? What made Ichiruki the ship I essentially gravitated towards for such a long time? When I revisited Bleach and to an extent Ichiruki, I realized the answer wasn't simple, but it was because because of how I responded to a specific sort of film framing. The reason was that if you think about it, Ichiruki often follows the female gaze. Now let's start off with the female gaze. What does the female gaze mean? To understand the female gaze, one must understand the male gaze. The male gaze is a framing of women in media that objectifies their bodies. It is about what a male deems as attractive or desirable rather than what is desirable for a woman themselves. It is male-centered and often cis male heterosexual centered framing of what is desirable for women in terms of romance. It also applies in terms of how men are framed on screen. So, for example, Thor taking off his shirt in like a Marvel movie is still the male gaze, but it is the male heterosexual perspective of what attraction looks like from a woman's perspective. So that is also a hypersexualized framing of a male body, but it's still the male gaze because that is what they envision sexual attraction to be for a woman. When in contrast, the female gaze, as Jill Soloway defines, is emotionally centered. It is about, as everyone says online, the yearning and the visceral feeling involved in being in love rather than surface level visual images or body parts of a person, for example. In the case of like Thor taking his shirt off or like in Transformers of Megan Fox leaning over a car to like fix it or whatever, like those are very sexualized visual images while in contrast the female gaze wouldn't be hypersexualized images of the people involved, wouldn't focus focus on solely the sexual aspect of a relationship. As Jill Soloway states, often it is subjective and not about being an object, but a subject who can return the gaze. As Jill Soloway defines in the TIFF speech that they made. It's for free on YouTube, so you can go check it out. I'll leave a link in the description. It's a very interesting talk that they did, so I definitely recommend watching it. But from that talk, they define the female gaze as a way of feeling, seeing a subjective camera, one that attempts to get inside the protagonist, particularly, but not always, but particularly when the protagonist is not a cis male. It uses the frame to share and evoke a feeling of being in feeling rather than looking at the characters. And they go on to say, it's not just showing you this thing, I really want you to feel it with me. So it's more about like feeling with the characters rather than just showing it to you. Extra components of a female gaze. Number one, Soloway defines how the emotions are prioritized over actions. Number two is female gaze shows us how it feels to be the object of a gaze. The camera says this is how it feels to be seen. The gazed gaze, as Soloway defines it. And then number three is returning the the gaze, which is basically like you aren't the only one gazing, but it is being gazed back at so you know you're being looked at and they know they're being looked at so it's a reciprocated gaze rather than just showing one person gazing. Now I want to add on to Soloway's definition due to the fact that online a lot of people talk about a specific example of a female gaze and that is from a Pride and Prejudice movie film specifically when Mr. Darcy I believe walks away from Elizabeth the main protagonist. We're seeing her perspective as he walks away. The camera zooms in 
in on his clenched fist. Due to the fact that this is a prime example of the female gaze, I'm going to also argue based upon Soloway's definition adding to it, I believe that the female gaze often includes small actions and tiny actions that are subtle but indicate a keen interest or care for the person. For example, Mr. Darcy, he clenches his fist. That is a very small action that you wouldn't really notice or care about if it was like a long shot and it wasn't zoomed in so deeply so that we see it from Elizabeth's perspective, like her eyes completely going to his hand to be able to see him clenching his fist. So in that case, it's a small action that you wouldn't really notice if you were just like standing there watching. But because we're seeing it from Elizabeth's perspective and we're seeing how she gazes at Darcy and how Darcy perceives her, that is an example of a female gaze from my understanding. So due to that, I would say it also involves small tiny actions you wouldn't really think too deeply about are given meaning due to the situation involved and the knowledge of the character's perspective we're seeing the show, movie, or TV show from. And I believe that could be said for any female gaze instance where oftentimes not only is it about, you know, being gazed at and returning the gaze, it's also about tiny actions that are not overtly super hypersexualized but are subtle and non-sexual in nature but are are very meaningful and show affection or love in alternate ways than the stereotypical male gay centered depictions of affection in film, which are often solely, you know, kissing and like everything else that is like super overt and obvious rather than like subtle is what I'm trying to say. Now you might be thinking, hold on, what do you mean Bleach has the female gaze? What the hell are you saying? It's Bleach, a shounen show. And you are right, Bleach as a whole, due to being a shounen anime series from the 2000s, is undeniably promoting and featuring the male gaze constantly. The essence of many shounen of this time were like this. Bleach has many examples of a male gaze in terms of the show itself. Hell, even Rukia's character character herself is also objectified in the male gaze. Definitely when Khan is involved in any way, shape, or form, she would be. But what I'm trying to argue here is that in multiple instances, and especially concerning Ichigo and Rukia's heartfelt moments, Bleach holds brief moments and scenes of the female gaze in the show itself, which I'm going to be highlighting in this video. Ichigo and Rukia's relationship emphasizes the importance of being equal. The premise of the show is that Rukia saves Ichigo and his family, and due to those circumstances of getting injured as a result of Ichigo impulsively trying to save the day without any powers, Rukia has to give all of her soul reaper powers to Ichigo in order for them to both remain alive along with Ichigo's family. But Ichigo, of course, accidentally ends up taking almost all of Rukia's spiritual powers, rather than the tiny part Rukia intend to give. As if Ichigo's soul was super greedy and was like, I want more of this, essentially sapping Rukia of all of her strength. So the plot of the show becomes the classic, we have to work together to fight Hollows, since Ichigo took Rukia's powers and someone has to be able to do her job in Katakuta Town, or else the Hollows will run rampant and hurt spirits as well as humans with high spiritual pressure. Rukia trains Ichigo on how to properly fight, occupying a position that isn't typical for female protagonists in Shonen, being a character with greater knowledge and fighting tactics than Ichigo, who essentially is just swinging his sword around without thinking about proper strategy. At the start of the show, even when Rukia didn't have powers, the two were a duo on equal terms. Rukia covered for Ichigo when he needed it, and Ichigo did the same for Rukia. This equal footing is important because it also later allows the gaze to be returned, as Soloway puts it. Ichigo, are you feeling okay? Hmm? Yeah, I feel great, but why are you asking? No reason. I'm just glad you're okay. The female gaze exposes emotional aspects of romance rather than only featuring physical and sexual acts between characters. The priority of emotions is evident between Rukia and Ichigo's relationship from the start when Rukia respects Ichigo's personal emotional boundaries. After Ichigo tells Rukia about the loss of his mother, Rukia tells him he doesn't have to tell her anything until he's ready to tell her. This line has so much importance to Ichigo that he himself uses it again in the series when he discovers his father is a soul reaver and tells his dad that he doesn't have to explain anything 
anything until he actually wants to. So Ricky respects Ichigo's personal emotional boundaries in this very emotional scene where they're running in slow-mo and it's almost like the world is slowing down for Ichigo and Rukia. It feels as if they're speaking for each other's thoughts, but I'm pretty sure they're like actually talking to each other. What Rukia says to Ichigo is very emotionally moving and proves that she respects Ichigo's personal boundaries. And when Ichigo reuses the same quote onto his father, I believe his father comments that Ichigo has matured. So he indicates that Rukia instilled this maturity in him and instilled this emotional awareness in him where he is more aware of like other people's boundaries and what they are willing to talk about when it's a very hard topic for them to speak about because of the personal trauma or like emotions involved with the person that perhaps Ichigo can tell that he shouldn't be overstepping his father's emotional boundaries in this specific moment like they could always talk about it later. And this is one specific example of the countless emotionally loaded scenes between Ichigo and Rukia where the show doesn't just focus on the physical aspect of a relationship but on what the person you love is comfortable with sharing a very serious topic when discussing relationships. Another instance where the show highlights emotional connections rather than showing surface level attractions is when it shows Rukia longing for this carefree and happy life in the human world as she stares down at everyone laughing on their way out of gym class from a bird's eye view of a classroom window and she's literally separated from them by the glass which is a visual representation of how Rukia doesn't feel like she belongs in the human world and that she somehow doesn't deserve to be feeling these emotions. She also denies to have any love for Ichigo when a girl in the class asks if she has feelings for him but before she denies it she hides her face away before answering that they're only friends with a very fake smile and put upon mask present to her classmates and to distance herself from being attached to the human world. Emotions are even further driven to be important by the very essence of why Rukia leaves Ichigo when she knows the soul society is chasing after her to arrest her. She mentions affection as something a soul reaper should never feel but implies that these are emotions like affection is an emotion that she discovered when teaming up with Ichigo and living in the same world world as him. By saying that she shouldn't be able to feel these emotions, it implies that she did feel affection for Ichigo in some way or form, and it's a subtle indication of romantic affection. Due to the emotional intensity of Rukia going against these human-like qualities, as she calls it, that she isn't supposedly allowed to feel. Finally, Ichigo implies through internal narration accompanied by Rukia smiling at him, the reason he saved Rukia was to see her smiling and happy again. He wants wanted to see her smile once more. If that is not prioritizing the emotional investment between these two characters, then I don't know what else is because Ichigo seeked out a simple emotional reaction from Rukia so that he was at ease knowing Rukia was no longer suffering in silence anymore as she is happier. It's a scene without any hypersexual desires involved. It's simply seeing the person you love happy. That is what Ichigo desires, not surface level one dimensional framing of woman to be sexual objects. He simply wants to see Rukia smile. What Ichigo narrates, I remember the reason I why I wanted to save you and it's like Rukia smiling at him and it's just Rukia being carefree, happy, and like you know not suffering in silence anymore in a jail cell. Like he just wanted her to be happy even if he expected the two of them to go back to the human world together in that he didn't expect her to want to stay. He respects the decision she makes. In summary, the very essence of this ship is prioritizing emotions since so many Ichiruki scenes often focus primarily on both of the characters personal emotions as well as their feelings on one another. As Soloway argues, the gazed gaze is what makes up the female gaze, and Ichiruki is saturated with countless moments where they return each other's gaze. Now, if Ichigo solely looked at Rukia with a longing gaze, and it was always one-sided in perspective without Ichigo and Rukia's reliance on one another equally, then the gaze would be too one-sided, and thus would result in the male gaze. As Soloway argues in their talk, the male gaze, when it is just a protagonist gazing 
at another protagonist with desire and it's only one-sided, then it has the risk of promoting the act of placing a woman upon a pedestal so that she becomes, as Selloway puts it, the virgin Madonna archetype, or what I would call the pure and innocent ideal woman archetype. This also promotes, as Selloway describes, the other archetype that goes hand in hand with the innocent woman archetype, which is the promiscuous woman archetype. Female characters often fall into either of these two archetypes when a singular male gaze is concerned. But Ichiruki does not follow a singular one-sided gaze. The gaze is returned by Rukia. It's not solely Ichigo placing Rukia upon a pedestal as some idealistic dream girl. Rukia looks longingly at Ichigo just as much as he looks longingly at her. As I stated before, the two are on equal footing, which encourages the return of the gaze constantly throughout the show. Now, when we're talking about returning the gaze, or the gazed gaze, it is relevant to mention how Bleach exhibits the gazed gaze by incorporating shoujo manga imagery within the anime show itself, and to an extent the manga. So in shoujo manga and anime, which is the prime place to discover the female gaze. It often features sparkling eyes which dazzle in the light to express their own personal emotions, whether it be sadness, affection, attraction, and love for their crush or love interest. As Hemmen states in shoujo manga, large eyes are connected to notions of innocence and vulnerability. So Rukia and also Ichigo both equally exhibit the stylistic choice of having the sparkling eyes that expresses their vulnerability and affection for one another through the way they gaze at one another, specifically in the reflecting emotion within their eyes. I won't be able to go over every single example in this show of a returned gaze because this show, as I said, is saturated within moments where Ichigo and Rukia return each other's gaze. So because of this, I'll be going over one of the most significant examples I found of Ichigo and Rukia returning the gaze. Ichigo saves Rukia at her execution, of course. One of the most iconic moments in the series, I would say. Like, for personally for me, this moment was probably the most iconic. The way Ichigo is framed specifically by partially showing different details of his clothing and hand, expressing Rukia's perception of Ichigo to the viewer. We, literally as an audience, are seeing like cuts of how Rukia perceives sees Ichigo. And the way she perceives Ichigo is not like a hypersexualized perspective, extreme slow-mo shot of like someone taking their shirt off, you know what I mean? Like those are the typical hypersexualized perspectives, but you just see cuts of very specific details like what he's wearing. When Ichigo does arrive, it is a very slow shot. Following the movement of Ichigo's billowing cloak, it is a shot that is framing the female gaze as we track how Rukia sees, perceives, and gazes at Ichigo. There are cut up shots of Ichigo's feet floating in the air, his hand on his sword's handle with bandages wrapping over his forearm, and obviously the cloak billowing in the wind, and then lastly Ichigo's face. All of these cut up shots are showing the details that Rukia perceives of Ichigo that exhibit her affection and attraction to Ichigo through the images of a camera. Because we are seeing the shot from her perspective, we can understand the affection she feels as she looks at Ichigo. And on Ichigo's end, all he says is like, hey, and his eyes are equally as soft as Rukia's, and he's also gazing at Rukia, clearly returning the gaze because they're looking at each other literally. Most obviously is the fact that he is smiling, but always scowling Ichigo, who is usually frowning most of the time, is legitimately like smiling at Rukia, which I feel like is a very clear indicator of Ichigo returning the affection. Obviously the most final moment where Rukia literally returns her powers to Ichigo again at the end of a series, which shows a return of a gaze because when Ichigo saved Rukia at the execution, she gazed at Ichigo mainly. Even though Ichigo did return the gaze at that moment because they're both looking at each other, it was a primary perspective from Rukia. In this episode, we see Ichigo's perspective of being saved by Rukia when she gives the powers to him once again. We only see Rukia's hands first on the sword and then we slowly see the rest of her body. But the fact that it focuses on her hands at first 
is once again showing yearning and like wanting to be with someone and the primary focus when it pans up from arms to her face the clear focus of the shot is Rukia's eyes the new animation style so it's like her very stylized large eyes with the very large sparkle in her eye to indicate intense emotions from Rukia's end as she gazes up at Ichigo and Ichigo's face before was completely broken up because he thought his father and Udahara literally betrayed him so he was like completely breaking down and especially in the manga from what I remember you could clearly tell and see like Rukia's reflection almost in his eye before she appears also his expression completely changed like if you see a before after shot when he thinks essentially his family betrayed him and that like no one is there for him and then seeing Rukia being there for him you see the light coming back into his eyes and obviously the metaphorical light comes back into his life in his inner world when the light appears and to an extent that light is a representation of Rukia even though obviously it's like technically everyone's powers combined the light is often enough an indicator of in terms of the inner world of like Rukia returning back into his life and breaking away the chains because like not only is he getting his soul rebirth powers back he's also getting Rukia back into his life who he is been in denial about missing this entire time so she returns Ichigo to a less depressed and sad state where he's desperate to get his powers back and he doesn't know what to do with himself basically and Rukia returns the light to his eyes gives him this wonderful pep talk after like they bicker a little bit because of course Rukia and Ichigo can't have an Ichiruki moment without partially bickering for part of it and then like returning back to like a normal state of calm but she does give him a pep talk and he like goes back into fighting mode and yeah he's totally rejuvenated and like back to his regular self like his confident I'm totally going to win this fight self like the classic Ichigo being witty having the best comebacks during fights like that energy she brought it back before Ichigo was struggling mentally and he needed that support and Rukia provided that support they emotionally support one another for one thing for another they equally return the gaze to one another and they both take turns saving one another which for me is the essence of why this ship emulates the female gaze so much because not only is it incorporating the return of a gaze but it's also incorporating very clearly a healthy relationship dynamic where they're on equal footing as I said before like it's not one person overshadowing the other Ichigo and Rukia are equally as supportive of one another and help one another and out on multiple occasions for the series Ichigo and Rukia's relationship heavily relies on returning the gaze at one another and by that very fact they are a clear example of a female gaze in a shonen anime. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I also believe that the female gaze incorporates tiny actions that are subtle, but through the screen's framing and the character's emotions and attraction to one another, the actions gain a deeper meaning of longing and returning affection. Because there are many tiny actions during Bleach between Ichigo and Rikia, I'm going to be going over these examples in a rapid fire list system rather than delving into each example very deeply. So the first small action is Rukia placing Ichigo's head in her lap as Ichigo falls into her arms completely passing out. Rukia even looks down and cups her hands around Ichigo's face when he's lying on her lap. Rukia grabbing Ichigo's wrist to run together down the hall and get to the hollow. Rukia tries to run to Ichigo when he's injured but Renji stops her and pushes her against the lamppost. Ichigo slams his fist down in the rain because he couldn't reach Rukia or save her. Instead he was protected by her once again. Ichigo carrying Rukia by the waist which is mirrored later on in the manga with Ichigo's father and mother's first romantic scene together. When they say goodbye in the soul society Ichigo awkwardly scratches the back of his head showing his nerves in a subtle action and the camera cuts to his hand falling to his side where his fingers move or clench slightly you could see. Him moving his fingers shows that he longs to be with Rukia and to stay with Rukia but due to the circumstances and what is best for Rukia he has to leave so he contains his want and desire to stay with Rukia and goes back to the human world. Rukia bracing a hand over Ichigo's neck 
when she tells him to bow to Orihime, but her hand lingers on his neck in one of the shots. In Waco Mundo, Ichigo literally tries to walk away from a fight for the first time ever when an enemy appears because Rukia is injured and he wants to go help her and make sure she's okay. I'm pretty sure that's the first time Ichigo legitimately was attempting to leave a fight. Usually Ichigo is pretty willing and like intent on fighting, but this time an enemy literally appeared and he was turning his back on an enemy, which I don't think had ever happened before that. Rukia jokingly tapping Ichigo's chest to break the tension when she's leaving and disappearing after Ichigo fully loses his powers. And in the manga, Ichigo recalls Rukia as an image to activate his full ring power, which Riruka defined as the power of love. This was cut out in the anime, but in the manga, there's a literal like little page spread, an image of Rukia disappearing from his eyes, and that's what activates the power. Obviously, he thinks of all the moments, but the last, like, most important moment that gets the biggest panel is of Rukia leaving him and due to the fact that Riruka says it's power of love it tells to me that subtly that they're indicating his thinking about Rukia spur on the power to emerge within him. These are all small actions but the meaning is clearly expressing a slow developing romantic intimacy between the two that doesn't sexualize or objectify either of them. So Ichiruki follows the female gaze. What does this mean in the grand scheme of things? Why am I suddenly making this video about this? Well, not only is it, you know, nostalgically motivated this video, and I was just feeling very nostalgic about Ichiruki and kind of wanted an excuse to make a video about them. But not only that, what does this mean in terms of how Bleach ended? Because we all know how the manga ended. And if you don't, then I suggest you click out of this video because that's what we will be discussing. Now, teenage me, who still had hope in this ship and was fairly optimistic would have argued that Kubo did all of this purposefully in terms of writing Ichigo and Rukia in the female gaze. Back then I would have argued he used the female gaze on purpose because he wanted us to read Ichigo and Rukia's relationship as romantic. But I am not a teenager anymore and I no longer have faith in Kubo as a writer due to how he ended the last chapter of Bleach. I'm not talking about the entire arc because I know he was rushed to end the arc, so not answering some questions is probably understandable, but the crime of a last chapter is too great for me to sweep away. It's one thing to not explain like your world building or general questions for the overall plot of a story, but it's a whole other debacle to fail at understanding your own key main characters, their motivations, their personalities, and who they are. In the last chapter of Bleach, for me, throws, I would say, majority of the characters, past characterization, into a dumb and then sets it on fire. So I cannot argue he did this purposefully because that would be giving him too much credit and honestly wouldn't logically make sense with how Ichigo and Orihime ended up being the canon ship at the end. And this isn't to put hate on another ship because I am a pro shipper. I believe you could ship whoever the hell you want to ship and it shouldn't really matter who the hell you ship. But if these instances are examples of a female gaze between Ichigo and Rukia, then it wouldn't make sense for them to exist and Orihime and Ichigo to be the end game ship, unless Kubo genuinely did not interpret the female gaze at all. That would be the only logical explanation. If he thought uh, or he made Ichigo were the canon ship, that means he didn't interpret Ichigo and Rukia's all those moments as romantic. So my argument for this video is that he accidentally utilized the female gaze for these two characters, thus the audience interpreted it as romantic. And in contrast, Kubo had no problem ending the series on Ichigo Ichigo and Orihime because he didn't see the story of Bleach through a female gaze lens. I'm once again, I'm like pro shipper. So Ichigo and Orihime, if you ship that, like that is your ship. I am like, yay, like that, that's a good thing. I'm not arguing against it. You cannot ship Ichigo and Orihime. But my argument for this video is an argument about Taikubo himself and that he did not read the series through the female gaze. I'm a Ichiruki shipper. I'm moments that I saw between Ichigo and Rukia did exhibit the female gaze and that was what I perceived the most out of a show, but due to the fact that it happened more often than not, throughout the series and reading the manga, I legitimately thought Ichigo and Rukia would end up canon. Like, to me, it just 
logically made sense but due to the fact that he didn't for me that indicates he did not perceive those moments as romantic which means the audience who saw Ichigo and Rukia as a romantic ship were perceiving primarily the series through a female gaze lens. Kubo saw the series through the male gaze where the male characters and to an extent the audience objectifies the woman's body and the lead via male character is like, I choose you. And not in the cute Pokemon way, but in the, you know, I take you as my object to claim you and hold you way. The classic, you are the woman I put on a pedestal. It was a speed run, I choose you. There wasn't any longing or reciprocation or a slow build up. Rarely any longing looks or moments where the two characters equally engage with one another. We don't see Ichigo pine for Orihime as often as we see Ichigo pine for Ru. For me, Ichigo didn't exhibit that as often. That isn't to say that Ichimi fans are like wrong, okay? I'm not here to attack any other shippers. I am a pro shipper, so you could ship like Ichigo with Orihime, you could ship Ichigo with Uriyu, you could ship Ichigo with Grimmajaw, Ichigo with literally anyone you want to ship him with. It doesn't matter to me. What I'm trying to say, like this argument is purely an intellectual argument. I'm trying to argue that Bleach, in terms of how Kubo wrote it and how he decided to end the final chapter, to me, me is an indicator he did not read this, his own series through the female gaze. He read it through the male gaze and this is even more proven correct by the very fact that the male gaze is constant throughout the show. I mean like the amount of fan service that happens for in terms of like every female character in the series and especially in the final arc which I want to make a whole other video on. The very essence of a shonen itself having fan service in all these instances where women are objectified on you know the casual regular like on the every couple of episodes was gonna be like a joke about Cone trying to like hug one of the girls you know what I mean like it's always there so it isn't a surprise that Kubo didn't read the series in the male gaze as an adult like I can understand that because once again he's a creator of the media he can read it however way he intended to read it and create it what I'm trying to say is it's interesting how an audience who engages with the media can read a series differently than the creator itself. You know what I mean? Like the audience members who perceived Bleach through the female gaze read an entirely different arc and storyline than what Kubo read based upon how he ended the manga. For us, that it was a slow building relationship between Ichigo and Rukia and the main plot was primarily action. Reading that final chapter, I was nearing the end of my high school life and I remember just being so blindsided by the fact that the way I perceived the series, the manga, the anime, everything was vastly different from how Kubo perceived it. And it just greatly shocked me that he didn't do an open ending or do Ichigo and Rukia that's becoming canon. For me, those were the only two options that felt logical in my brain. Obviously, he didn't take either of those actions and he decided to make or he made Ichigo canon. And that is fine. It's just that I want to mention how sudden and shocking it was as a teenager just seeing how differently fans perceive form of media. And personally, I still perceive perceived bleach through the female gaze as you can tell by the very essence of this video. Obviously it has a lot of the male gaze and it's something I choose to ignore if I do rewatch episodes or skip over if there's any like cringy like fan service scenes. The very essence of Ichigo and Rukia's relationship for me doesn't lose quality in terms of the anime even though a lot of us like the fans whoever might have clicked on this video and agree with me that Ichiruki exhibits a female gaze we've simply perceived the series in a different way than Kubo perceived it. I don't know if you all remember, but Ichigo's voice. Um, do you all remember it sounding like this? Maybe you should try worrying about yourself for a change. Ichigo. Don't you worry. I'm not dying today. Fact is, I've gotten a lot stronger while you were away. I forgot how freaking flirty Ichigo was in the show. Like, I definitely recommend you revisit Bleach because Ichigo's dub voice actor was killing it, man. Not to mention literally every Ichiruki moment had me going, is this allowed? Like, a shonen anime where the protagonists actually seem into each other? Like, I kind of forgot that was a thing. <laughs> I feel like it's a lot of fun to revisit an old show that you haven't watched in a while, so I definitely recommend if you're ever bored or in the mood 
to rewatch something you haven't seen in a long time, definitely recheck out the shows that got you into anime because it's always interesting to look back at what sort of started off your journey into this type of media that you love. At the time I first watched Bleach, I was in grade 7 and it was the second anime show I ever watched. Bleach was basically my introduction to anime and Ichiruki was likely a part of my initial discovering of what shipping was. The start to my fall into the whole shipping community and being a shipper. Likely at that age, the teen shows on television at that time all garnered to the male gaze or featured typical sexualized notions of romance. But Ruki and Ichigo's romance was not limited to those perspectives. It was a romance that was unsaid and unspoken and slowly building. It was emotional and visually captivating. It made you feel things. An unexplainable connection and closeness that seemed to evade concrete descriptions. To put it simply, when I found Ichiruki, I think I found what romance could potentially feel like. In a cinematic way, obviously. Rukia and Ichigo's relationship relationship introduced me to a whole new world of romance that relied and often featured the female gaze and it definitely set up a road work for the types of ships and romantic storylines that I enjoyed following in the future. So that is my video folks. I hope you enjoyed it. It was obviously very long and it took a long time to research because I had to greatly research Selaway's definition of a female gaze in order to make this video. and. Obviously Bleach is a very long series, so it took a while to get all of my examples in order. So thanks for watching. If you've actually stuck till the end, let me know because that would be kind of hilarious if you did because this will be very long. So thank you for watching and hopefully my next video will not be as a big of a break in between. See you all next time.